Post-Truth Apocalypse. I'm Ben, and as always, I'm hanging out with Mike, Hello. Claire, hey. and Pete. Hello. Today we're going to talk about the World War II German Nazi space program, which we can't put Nazi in the title because YouTube suppresses it. YouTube suppresses it, and you know. But yeah, this is this is Nazi stuff. We're doing a history episode mm. on Nazis. Well, a space program. <laughs> I just wanted to say Nazi. It's a conspiracy history episode because there's time travel as well. Mm. <laughs> We're in for a treat then. Yeah. Of course, as always. Let's run through some of the top places that have been listening to us this week. We've got quite a list, but I'll start somewhere in the middle. Stoke on Trent in the United Kingdom, Queens, New York, uh, Taipei, Taiwan, <laughs> Colchester in the United Kingdom, uh, Charlotte in North Carolina, Banja Luka in Bosnia Herzegovina, New Plymouth in Idaho, that's new, uh, London in the UK. Atlanta, Georgia, Springfield, Ohio, New City, New York, Bangalore, India, Warsaw, Poland, Madrid, Spain, Bournemouth, Oregon, Brooklyn, New York, Guadalajara, Spain, and Ashbury, Virginia. Surprise, Yay. surprise. Ashbury, Is it the top, top. top ten. Thank you to everybody. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's get into it. I found this article. Um, was, you know I'm like part of some weird groups yes. on Facebook. You're a weird man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, you're right. I'm proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just pointed was, at it and just... I'm pointing at the fact I can't see anything because the mic's right in front of the screen now. Yeah. That's all. Never mind. I don't want to see! I want to see! <laughs> yeah, that's that, that face. <laughs> I want one. <laughs> Can I have one? So, I found this article. It was entitled Astronauts of the Third Reich Travelled in Time from 1943 to 1990. And I thought, looks like we're doing a Natty episode. <laughs> It's like, how can you ignore that headline? It reached out and grabbed me with my uber nuts. <laughs> it's a hell of a headline. It is. Now, obviously, World War II is the most terrible event in the history of mankind. Thus far. Thus far. And it should be noted that it was this tinderbox that largely served the technical advance of the 20th century. And yeah, it's as sad as it sounds, a lot of stuff came out of World War II. A lot of stuff. Not just weapons of death. The space program, for a start, came out of World War Two. Pushed us forward, the didn't it? The rockets that yeah. the Germans invented. Does, that's a problem. War pushes technology like nothing else. <clears throat> your advances in medicine, your advances in in prosthetics, your advances in plastic surgeries. Are you better armored tanks? Yeah, things yeah. Like that. Yes, true. Or an atomic weapon, as the Manhattan Project was. Yeah, what's the biggest one now? Is it the Satan 2, is it? From Russia? Satan 2, 2, 2, <laughs> bigger, better, bolder, redder. <laughs> <laughs> it's still designed to kill us all. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's a city killer. That's a several, multiple city killer, because they all have multiple guided warheads, yeah, don't they? One, more, one of them will take out a giant city like London. Gone. Maybe a couple. London's very big. I'm not about Greater London, I'm not about... Oh, the centre of London. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's gone, that's vaporised, there's nothing left of that. Well, you're talking about a 20 mile radius, aren't you, in the blast mm. zone? Mm. Well, hey, guided missiles came out of World War Two, mm. And no matter how disgusting we are with all the misdeeds, the desire to become the first in various industries has remarkably accelerated development, including the space industry. Are you guys aware that Nazi specialists helped the US develop space science and military development? Are you aware of this Project Paperclip? It's something I've heard of before, but I've never delved into it. But Claire? Haven't we done a bit about Project Paperclip? You discussed it before, thank you. Yeah. yeah. In a nutshell, you've got the Allies in the West, Britain, America, Canada, Free French, etc., etc., Polish, whoever else is there, sweeping across them, but they stop at the river Elba. As far as they go, they let the Russians have East Germany, Berlin, because that was agreed upon. And the Allies didn't want to take the probably 100,000 plus casualties it would have taken to take Berlin. Yeah. 
So all the prominent German scientists who are fleeing because the Nazi state has collapsed have got a choice. They either go east or west. Now, personally, I'm probably going west yeah. if I'm one of those guys. So a lot of them tried to flee west and special squads were sent out to collect these guys, to round them up because they're all known through intelligence. They know they're at these projects because like, you know, they're firing these things at London. They're firing V2s and V1s at London. Who's designing these? We need to find out. We need to know before we bomb the place back we to need Stone to get Age. Them. So basically, yeah, we gave them a pardon and said if you come work for us, we won't Yeah, keep, we, won't, we won't shoot you. That's it. I mean, the, the most prominent guy of all was a guy called Werner von Braun, who was literally the father of NASA. Mm. Designed all the rockets, including the uh, the ones that took man to the moon and into space. Mm. And it was shocking because we forgave a lot of people for some heinous shit for their technical abilities and knowledge. But at the end of the day, they would have been probably forced to make these things in the first place. <clears> Who? <throat> Werner von Braun? No, he wasn't forced to make it. This was his. He loved rockets. He was a, a rocketry fan from when yeah. he was a child. But that's the catch. Love here. Waffer or whoever. No, the people they pardoned are going to have it. Mm. Well, I'm saying like, like the Love Waffer and that might well have been like. No, we talk- make us these rockets or you die. And so he made them for. He, them. Wa- he wanted to make rockets. Yeah, this was his dream want- to make rockets. He wanted to go to the moon, and that was his thing. He. His ambition as a child was to build a rocket to go to the moon. My point is, he might not necessarily have been an arsehole or a bad guy. He might have been forced by the Nazis to make the rockets for hey, them. Hey. Do you know what I mean? It's quite possible that... That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That could he well saw, he well, saw that been... as the best route, but he still became a member of the SS. Yeah, yeah. yeah he the... still knew whether the slave labourers were building his rockets and they were yeah. dying in their hundreds as they did it. Well, I don't I'm think sure a lot scientists... of them had much of a chance. Yeah, I'm sure there were scientists that were quite enthusiastic about them as well. More than You're likely. also looking at... People People like uh, guys who worked with Mengele, mm. they weren't doing it because they were told to, they were doing it because they, they fucking enjoyed to. it. Yeah. But there's got to have been a certain amount of them that weren't doing it because they wanted to, yeah. they were doing it because they I had to. Yeah. Yes, but in that sort of society, the sociopaths float to the top. Yeah. Allegedly, as early as 1939, the, I'm going to say allegedly a lot, this article says this is fact, I'm going to say allegedly. Mm. The first manned flight of a spacecraft based on the V-2 was made. However, the first tests failed and the device exploded at the time of launch. That's a possibility, timeline-wise. They, they forgot to take out the warhead of the V-2 and just stuck someone in it and went, See how far this goes? Oh, shit. <laughs> Probably something to do with the fact that the v tool had a, a liquid hydrogen mix, a liquid alcohol mix, sorry, and it was T-stuff and S-stuff. And there were two volatile chemicals that were mixed together, produced massive amounts of energy and rage. The problem is... Rage. Rage. <laughs> rocket fuel rage. <laughs> uh, but enough to lift a, a rocket with a warhead on the top of it. Rage. You put one in first. You put the S-stuff in first, for example. And then a clean-up crew has to come in and literally hose down the entire area because if you get one fucking drop of this T-stuff into a drop of S-stuff Boom. on yeah. the floor... You've got a volatile reaction next to a, an S-stuff filled rocket. Mm. It's very similar to what we use now. Our torpedoes and rockets that we have as well. Even now, our nowadays torpedoes are still powered in exactly the same way. Ooh. Mad. But it's, it's slightly different named products. Yeah. <laughs> but I would imagine they're pretty fucking similar. And one of them, if it, it solidifies on when it hits air... If you stepped on a crystal of its in its solid form, it would explode. Wow. And you would lose your foot, probably half your leg. It's so fucking dangerous, Volatile, this stuff. Yeah. If I remember rightly, it's probably an abbreviated name. I think it was Hop or Hap. I can't remember now. Can't think of the other one. I remember... The it's the same thing. But yeah. You get them together very fucking scary in a controlled shit. way <laughs> and you can use it to make thrust. Yeah. You get them together in the wrong way and you've got a very major problem on your hands. Boom. And three months later they tried That's again. Yeah. <laughs> this time the rocket was able to reach a height of 45 kilometres from where two pilots jumped out on parachutes. Oh, yeah, 45 kilometres. That's not quite space, but right. it's getting very close. Higher than Boeing like 7. Boeing mm-hmm. 747 sits at what, 37,000 feet? So What's it in miles? Uh, how many? 40 what? 42? 45. 45. You're talking about 30, 
two, thirty three miles, something like that. It's about halfway to space, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> you depending on your definition of space. You? you wouldn't want to parachute out of a jumbo jet at 37,000 feet. I think so add another eight to it. Mm. I think space starts when you're starting to float in it. No, no, you can get... I think some say it's 60 miles and some say it's 52. NASA qualifies it as something like the 60 mark, I think. Isn't it when the oxygen's no longer in the atmosphere, basically, that's when it becomes space, would it, would it not? Yeah. My classification of space would be... You, Just above be, the clouds. No, you've got to be floating, you've got to be floating. What if you're Superman? Well, what if you're not? <laughs> Then you shouldn't be floating in space. <laughs> <laughs> three months later, they tried it again. Sorry, a similar operation was performed three more times in 1940 and 1941, and each time with success. The pilots returned by parachute, and finally in 1943, the secret and greatest Nazi attempt was made. Ooh. According to the chronicles extracted from the secret archives of the SD, which was the secret police division in the Third Reich under Hitler. Okay. Uh, the testimony is unequivocal. Following personal instructions from Adolf Hitler, three of the best Luftwaffe pilots were carefully selected for space flights. I'll just say it's 62 miles. 62 miles. That's NASA's definition, is it? The Kármán line, yeah. 100 kilometres. 330,000 feet. It's just out of interest. Practically halfway to space. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm. So at, at that point, can you actually float? <laughs> yes, I guess you would be if you weren't strapped down. Because you would be at that point. No, no, you wouldn't. The forces could make you float if you weren't strapped in, but you'd be strapped in for that. Mm -hmm. You're being ejected, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Are you thinking like jumping out of the plane with your parachute and just like staying there, like? Put it down! Yeah. Oh shit! DB <laughs> oh, Cooper, bullets. he jumped out of a jet flying at 37,000 feet hmm. in a suit. Well, there's that guy that jumps off the balloon thing that went up. Yeah, but he had a spacesuit on, didn't he? Yeah, but how high was he? He was literally on the edge of space because he, he was in a spacesuit. You can so see. So would he have been at probably that kind of. He'd have been as high as he could get without having to burn up in the atmosphere. Because you could proper see, like, you could see okay, like, picture, that yeah. of the world, couldn't you? So you was probably... Fish eye lens. Well, Sorry. Oh, <laughs> you flat earth fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I wonder how high that was. Very, very high. It was, it was, it was a 60. Because he didn't float, that was my point. <laughs> he was tethered as well, remember, yeah. He was tethered, So they did it three more times in 1940 and 1941. They've selected the three best Luftwaffe pilots. For these space flights, they're gonna put guys into space and decide. The Red Baron, we will have him. He is very good. Oh, uh, he yeah. died. Oh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> the training was carried out in the strictest secrecy for about a year, with the participation of the best specialists from Germany and occupied Europe. There's also evidence that before the launch of the rocket into space, a welcome telegram from Hitler arrived at the Peenemünde base in which he expressed his gratitude to the three pilots who were willing to sacrifice themselves in the name of the glory of the Third Reich. Uh. A two-stage rocket designed for these pilots was built in the Mittelwerk underground factory and its launch was planned for 1944, but due to the turning point of the war, because it all started going to shit, the deadline was shortened considerably. Despite this, three military officers, Holt Sigmar, Heinrich Woll and Schultz Feinberg, made a successful nice. flight in the first man-made spacecraft. Mm. Now, one would not be able to believe this it was, if it were not for the documents obtained in 1944 near the Mittelwerk plant, Soviet troops captured and further explored this strategic facility. The fact is, in addition to the construction of spacecraft, this plant was engaged in the creation of an atomic bomb and V-shells, which are the shells that will be used in the V-3 vengeance weapon, which is the London gun. Atom bomb is a creepy thing. If they hadn't been so anti-Semitic, a lot of some of the leading physicists in the world were Jewish at this time, people like Einstein. Mm. If they hadn't been so anti-Semitic, the Germans could well have had yeah. an A-bomb first. And they were really looking at it, and before the war they led the world in atomic research. And then it all seems to just fall away from them. They upset the wrong people, clearly. Well, it went tits up with Operation Barbarossa, didn't it? 
Well, there's that, but the, when you think of the billions they spent on some of these weapons, especially the V2, I mean, something like two billion marks. Well, imagine if they had that to spend on tanks and guns and planes instead. And, you, and you, then when you think as well, well the that, A-bomb. Was, mm-hmm. that was in the 40s. And then, <laughs> and then you, because you haven't really got a long-range heavy bomber, Germany never did develop one during World War Two. you can strap it to that, because that, the V2 can take a ton warhead. It's a one-ton nuclear device on London. Yep. Sayonara. Yeah. Yeah, World War Two would have been very different. Than more that. than likely, straight onto the fucking Russian armies outside of Berlin, <laughs> or advancing over Berlin. You'd be firing as many as possible, wouldn't you? Has anybody read or seen the Man at High Castle? I've started watching it, actually. It's good. Yeah, I'm a couple of episodes in. I Basically, forgot. the Nazis and the, the Japanese won the war. Right. So Germany really had Europe, yeah. half of America. They split America down... So it's based on Wolfenstein then? I never played it. Oh, Wolfenstein, yeah, to a point, yeah. <laughs> well, no, Man in the High Castle came first. Oh, did it? Yeah. Oh, that's pre- It's like a novel in the 60s. Oh, okay. So Wolfenstein is yeah, based it's, on um, that then, maybe. Philip K. Dick wrote yeah. it. So it's just okay. playing out what would happen if... If you know, it was the other way around. Yeah. yeah. But then you've got this Cold War between Germany and Japan then. Yeah. Because they're still both highly militarised states. The US is split into three. So you've got the, the Nazi side, the Japanese side, and then you've got the neutral zone in the middle. Which is like a shithole. And a yeah, because the Japanese, place. Had, at that point, in the like, 40s, 50s, the Japanese had like one of the fastest spends on militarising no, in the 40s and 50s the world. they didn't. Like, in, the, they did. in the 30s and 40s. For- I was watching a timeline on it. It wasn't the 50s because they didn't have a military, they only had a defence force and they weren't allowed an army after the Second it, World War. It, it You're was thinking later on as well. Uh, from somewhere in the period between 1900, 1880 80 something, World I mean, War. they smashed the Russians in, in 1905. It would have been up to <laughs> the end of the Second World War. It was like Up to the end of the Second World War, they, they yeah. They were like, they were high in the top ten. But there were they spent, they've just increased their defence spending actually. They, but well, they, I think they restarted again in like the ninety, like they, the late nineties, and that they started. They did again. purchase took America to modernise, and now they've inc- they recently agreed an increase because of uh, North Korean aggression. I thought you said Japan, like you know, I, I had very little military. Yeah, it's it's been it's, it's quite a peaceful place. It's it? on, it's got a small military, but they're all very professional because it's professionals only. I think um, it's it was purely used as a defence force until the war on terror when the Japanese did deploy. Oh no, sorry, first Gulf War was the first time Japanese troops were deployed, and they were only there to guard prisoners of war. They didn't get part in any offensive operations. Well, they, I, they vowed not to, didn't they, after the Second World yeah, War? I think they might have now. I'm not sure if they joined the War on Terror or not. Mm. They must have done are something. Are they part of NATO? Well, no, they're part of, part of the Yeah, of course they are. Every country is, aren't they? No, not every country. Part of the most, UN. Rus- most Russia countries. certainly isn't. It is, yeah. yeah Russia yeah. still is. It's on the Security it's Council. Yeah. It's got a veto. If it, yeah, it's probably one of the security camps or one of the big six. I'm pretty sure every country's in the UN. Yeah. No, there's a couple of tiny little oh, countries yeah. that aren't, but yeah. Well, it's it's like, Sudan like, or something. I don't know. Well, why? Oh. I think it's a smart move not to have military and defences. No, they've got defences, but they haven't got any military for attack. For attack, right. Yeah. No offence. But it negates that anyway because... The best form of defence is a good offence. Well, no, because <laughs> the, they let US troops into their country and bases... Right. Yeah, I mean, Japan has been pretty much. I think there's still troops there. That yeah, they've been occupied. It's an island, isn't it? It's basically a big US camp. Hokkaido, mm. is it? Yeah, I think so. So is it kind of the American military or their military? <laughs> no, they, <laughs> they they've, they've got a, a reasonably well, probably about a hundred thousand guys, but soldiers. Got a lot of money. They're US in trained. It. They're US equipped. They're considered quite a decent force, even though they never they've got no experience. I guess. Mm. But it's the money they've got, I think, gives them a good advantage because they've probably got fucking high tech stuff. Most of their kitchen, they don't think they've got any native arms industry. To be honest, I'm not sure. I think most of their stuff's bought off America. They've probably got like laser guns and shit, mate. <laughs> you know how far ahead they are in the future. They're probably walking well, around with like 
instant shields and shit that they just press a little button no, on their armour? No, we're not that far. <laughs> and this, in the 1940s, though, Nazi Germany is looking at sci-fi, isn't it? They wanted to put people into orbit, and, and they're planning to build an orbital weapon. They wanted to make a ray gun, a big mirror in space with the yeah. fucking face in the sun, and they just rotate it round and take out a city. Fuck. Huh? It's a bit Austin Powers, that, isn't it? Yeah. Well, well Austin Powers Simpsons. got their inspiration from these. Yeah. Simpsons as well, yeah. What is it, though? Simpsons mm. did it. Simpsons did it. Yeah. I mean, obviously, none of this stuff ever got past the, the drawing stage. Luckily. But if it was like, as in Man High Castle, then it might have been because they would have won the war. And yeah, they could have been on the moon. Yeah, they'd have had the time to carry on with yeah. what they were. Yeah, what they were planning. Well, let's say, America got to the moon in 69, and they did get to the moon, regardless of whatever anyone says, they did get there. They had to play catch-up. Even though they had the German scientists and the, and the captured V2s, they still got to improve them more. Now, they'd been going a lot longer, and you can guarantee they didn't give them everything. Mm. Gave them enough, but you always keep a little bit back, don't you? So the Nazis could have been there in what? I don't know. By 1960? Might have been earlier, by 1950. Mm. If they'd have won. If they get into space at this point, the logical thing would have been, yeah, well, mid-50s think, maybe. You think how fast technology advances once you get to one stage, it's like the next stage, it's even quicker kind of thing. Like, look, you, you need to look at mobile phones and computers and things yeah. like that. and just think they'd have more resources. Yeah, they already had all these resources. Because they've conquered Europe, it. for God's sake. And yeah, yeah, yeah. All the gold. Yeah. Yeah, all the plutonium, all the everything. All the science facilities they've captured. Yeah. The resources. Well, you'd, they'd be instantly get all the research from each other country, wouldn't they, in that mm. sense? Like, they'd, they'd have yeah. their research available to them straight away. Well, like, yeah, we'd wow. all be puppet states and that's the Empire. That would have been scary, fucking hell. Yeah. Anybody that didn't have blue eyes, that could have been a thing as well. well I'm alright then. I'd have been alright. Blonde hair, blue eyes as a baby, you would have been alright. Anybody <laughs> that doesn't. I was blonde hair, blue eyes, yeah. <sighs> Claire, and you went ginger. Ah, oh, you'd have been. Your neck would have just been snapped. Come out, your no, no, you, 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 had, neck. you had levels of it. I mean, it's all about the ancestry. Mm. Mm. You know, they go back like 130 years if you wanted to join the SS. Trace your ancestry back. They had people that researched your ancestry mm. to make sure you had no trace of anything but pure Germanic blood. Mm. They used to do school shapes, phonology, which obviously was dismissed as nonsense. You know, the shape of your school determines your race and all that. And then this is the... And there was, like, five categories of area of school shape. And where you were on that list, if you were number one, you're fucking... You're up there, boy. You're getting fucking... You've got preferential treatment here. And obviously, shit... You, you know, you can get the you're top jobs as officer. you get all... You'll be an officer. <laughs> well, you're an officer. But, and you're in the general staff. And you're going for fucking... You'll be one of the big boys one day. Mm-hmm. And as it goes down, you get the shitter jobs... Now, if you're like a five, then you're not going to rise as high in that society because you're not as Aryan. You might even have limits placed on your breeding. <laughs> bit of you, a mongrel. Who, so you, who you could matter. If anybody killed you, then it would just no. be, you know. Any, they'd only kill you if you had an illness, a debilitating illness. Mm-hmm. And if you were disabled, it. basically, yeah. And, and, of course, anyone who was homosexual. Mental uh, illnesses male, as well. Mental illnesses. They're gone. Yeah. Blacks they didn't like either. No, or, even though they did have some black troops in World War Two, oh, they, they were, did were towards they, the end. But, I'm guessing. No, were uh, on the Russian front though. Yeah, yeah. Were, how <laughs> not were they many. Used? How were they used? That's the question, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. I mean, there were wasn't they just pushed to the front. Go. Yeah, yeah. there yeah, wasn't. <laughs> there wasn't many. It's only because Germany had East African colonies before World War One, right? And they lost them after that. Mm. And some of the black people emigrated to Germany, they felt more German than... People that were on their side in World War One went to Germany, yeah. Yeah, basically. So World War Two, they did have a few, very few black soldiers mm. floating around. Mm. But remember those astronauts who went up? Yeah. Right, and they got... Turns out they survived and returned to the Earth, but after 47 years. This is the conspiracy part of this tale. Ah, OK, right. In 1990, in the Atlantic Ocean, an American destroyer noticed an unusual object on the surface of the water. 
Inside the capsule there were three people in strange suits, vaguely reminiscent of diving gear with several layers of foil and thermal insulation. For some reason there's a picture of a Nazi UFO there. <laughs> While on dry land, all three crew members came to their senses and they were immediately sent to a special centre for the study of near-Earth space where they underwent a thorough check. Turned out that all three astronauts were healthy and feeling well. Of course, for them, returning to Earth was a shock, especially when they found out they were launched into space half a century ago. <laughs> they turned out to be German, but did not have any documents with them. On the capsule itself was a faded image of the Luftwaffe coat of arms or a black cross. Although at first the Germans were reluctant to answer all the questions, in the end they were forced to talk. I guess the Americans are the enemy at that point, aren't they? Like, oh no, we've been captured by the Yanks. Mm -hmm. Act 9! <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. We will not talk to you, American pig dog. Mm -hmm. Like, mate, it's 1990. You lost the war, like, 60 years ago. We like the Germans now, come on. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah, I had to... Oh, someone bring them a history video. We're all friends we're all, now. Yeah, we're all buddies. We love your beer. We do Oktoberfest and everything. Yeah. Holt Sigmar and Heinrich Voll claim that after entering Earth's orbit, a breakdown occurred and the compartment with Schutz Fenberg was depressurised. His own capture was autonomous, but due to control failure, he was in a state of loss of control. And his trip was basically a free fall, and on the third day, the men were exhausted. And they just fell asleep when they hit there, at the impact. Okay. <laughs> so how come nobody's ever heard of this before? Then? Well, these are unclassified documents from the USSR, of all places. They woke up when they heard a large ring in their ears, and a green flash appeared before his eyes. Sorry, this is the launch. I don't know. This is the launch, which turned into a tunnel, and the capsule with the astronauts was literally sucked inside. Here's where it gets stranger. Mm -hmm. After flying for several minutes, they found themselves in the middle of a desert landscape. The sand was orange-red and there were two suns in the sky where they don't remember anything else. Or Tatooine. Oh my god, <laughs> they went to Star Wars! Uh, <laughs> That's where the... Oh no, Star Wars has been out at this point, 1990. Oh, it was George Lucas fucking did the prequels of this guy's fucking visions. <laughs> How the German pilots ended up on Earth and why they didn't age after 47 years in space is a mystery. What is most surprising is that, according to the documents, the three people with these names are actually on the Luftwaffe list, and all three died, quote, oh. while carrying out a secret mission. But the amazing oddities didn't end there. The sailors of the American destroyer, destroyer who discovered the German astronauts in the vastness of the ocean, found neither water nor food in their space capsule. They were eating alien food, surely. Mm. Or well, for them it was minutes, minutes, and for us it was forty-seven years. Ooh. Well, I was going to highlight the fact that they said it was strange that they hadn't aged in forty-seven years. I was thinking it was strange the fact that they managed to survive in this little capsule for forty-seven years. Mm. <laughs> that food and water yeah. and lack of toilet facilities. Mm. <laughs> After forty-seven years, that's well, a lot of poop. It is. <laughs> After returning to Earth, the astronauts began to age rapidly, though. Mm. Already in the year 2000, only Heinrich Voll survives. Only ten years later, there's only one of them left. Okay, this is where it's getting into the realms of bollocks, isn't it? What's that film with Mel Gibson? Forever Young. Forever Young, that's what that sounds like to yeah, me. Yeah, he was in yeah. cryo sleep, wasn't he? Mm. Did he age rapidly? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's where they took this from, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> He was repeatedly. You mean the the film took this from from this? No, it was right, mate. No, I think I think, was, I think for you it was based on this. They got the idea for this <laughs> article from the film. No, I think it was the other way around. Sounds like there's a bit of Star Wars, a bit of fucking Forever Young. What was the other things that we've seen in there that could certainly be film plots? So, like the you green were saying, flash appeared, which turned into a tunnel. Like, Stargate, Bill yeah. and Ted. You know, <laughs> said earlier on you were going to say allegedly a lot. You haven't actually said allegedly much. No. But I, think, I, I was think sucked we, into the story. I think, I think we've just summed this allegedly up. It's someone I've, with a really good I've, imagination. I've been sucked into the story. <laughs> Obviously, the film buff who wrote this. <laughs> your brains have been sucked out your head. <laughs> oh, like the Riddler's device. <laughs> yeah. Me and Mike have been watching all the Batman movies. Brilliant. Like, 
I even watched the very first one. Is this ready for the new one? The 1943 yeah. one. Oh, right. On YouTube. I, I would say I watched it. I stuck about 20 minutes of it before he did it. Did, did you watch the... Um... But you, it, back then, it, he was always called The Batman. Hmm. He was never called Batman. He's always The Batman. And it wasn't The Bat Cave. It was The Bat's Cave, for some reason. Hmm. Really bizarre. Did you um, watch the uh, film that Adam West did? No, because they did do a film. They did do they a did. film. You're right, actually. Yeah. Is that the I've one never watched it, but I know they did a film. Is that one with the shark? <laughs> no, that was an, an episode, episode, I think. It? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, he fights a shark on a ladder. A shark, because everything is labelled bat, isn't it? He's yeah. ever, he's got his utility belt. He always belt. has a device and for had, that specific yeah, thing. Sprayed, bat shark repellent. Yeah, and it had like, <laughs> and, he, and he sprayed it on it, and it fucked off. <laughs> Quality. <laughs> Uh, but, but I have come to the startling conclusion that the George Clooney film Batman and Robin is better than Batman Forever which is the one with Val Kilmer I think they're as bad as each other Val Kilmer is definitely the worst Batman I, see I disagree with that I, I think like he did Val okay Kilmer. he's very wooden watch it you again like him, I like Val Kilmer no watch it watch it yeah, again right awful. and tell me how wooden he is yeah, so I like how was... wooden he is. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't anymore. <laughs> so who was the first one? What was his name again? Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton. He was good. He I like Keaton. Like. And then, who did number two then? Wasn't that Val Kilmer? No, it was no. Keaton again. It was Keaton did number two. Batman Returns. Did he? Yeah. yeah. I like Jim Carrey as well. He was in the. No, he's the only good thing about. He's the only good thing about that film. To- even Tommy Lee Jones, who plays Two Face in that movie. Yeah. He's just a cackling idiot. Yeah, he and is. they literally, uh, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Batman Forever, sorry, it's been out for like fucking nearly 30 years. <laughs> but they literally break into Bruce Wayne's mansion, shoot him, graze his head, he falls down the stairs, he's knocked unconscious, and Two Face puts a gun at his head, and he's like, oh, well, here we go, I'm going to kill Batman. And Jim Carrey goes, no, 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 don't kill him. He won't no, learn. He won't learn anything. You're like <laughs> you literally have the the, the the whole point of you being you need to kill Batman. Then the city is yours, and he's unconscious on the floor. You got a gun to his head. If I'm Two Face, you let right? him live so we can learn from his mistakes. No, yeah, no. What I do is I punch Jim Carrey's Riddler in the face, shoot him in the face, and then shoot Batman in the head. Because <laughs> then all my problems are solved, and I'm running Gotham, and I'm. Uh, yeah. He has to flick the coin though, doesn't he? You know what? Flick it again until you get the result you want. That's what he usually does. <laughs> but, oh, So Val Kilmer did three. No, yeah, number three, yeah. And who did four? That's, when That's George, George Clooney. Clooney. And do you know why it went so campy from the dark Tim Burton set of films? Mm. Because McDonald's is a promotion with Batman Returns and... When the film came out, apparently the penguin scared the shit out of all kids. Yeah, he's a scary <laughs> character, man. Especially when the black goo was coming out of his mouth at the end. Yeah. And it just caused an uproar in America, saying it was too dark for kids. And, and they were like, oh, well. It was quite just... dark, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, it wasn't quite as dark as the second. The Joker, second. when he falls into the pit of. Um... Yeah, it's not like the second is No, well the dark. second one's a lot darker yeah, than the first. It is. But I watched the first one in the cinema as a as like an eight seven eight year old kid, and I remember being a bit like, "It's when he when he fucking fries the guy with the yeah um, the yeah, yeah 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 when he shakes his hand." That's quite. quite it is quite a dark film, film and it, yeah, that yeah. Age. But I was gonna say is that, that was even darker. Yeah yeah. Definitely. And then obviously they were like, "Oh, we're not gonna sell any toys if it, if it's not for kids," so they made it more campy, like the sixties. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, it was fucking. Yeah, awful. Good tangent. <laughs> I know it's a controversial <laughs> opinion, but I'm, I'm going with it. Anyway, in 2004, he also died. At the time of his arrival in 1990, he looked like he did in 1943, a 36 year old pilot in the prime of his life. He died old. His body had aged half a century during his 10 years in the United States. And now, according to American reports, the German capsule could not protect the pilots from cosmic radiation, and it's generally doubtful that this development was launched into orbit. But the strange signs, the accelerating aging, and in fact the appearance of the device based on the V2 with the coat of arms of the Luftwaffe in 1990, cannot be attributed to forgery. As it becomes clear, 
the question of what their mission was is becoming more and more important and relevant because the question of where the capsule has been with the Nazi astronauts for these long years and why it seemed that they were sent into space just before the day before. Oh, that's tragic, isn't it? That's, tra that's a question. It's fascinating. <laughs> why? Uh, you sounded like so it's like Alan Partridge then. <laughs> <laughs> why? Hmm. They want space weapons. Yep. All right, so what do we think of that? What do you think of those claims? Bollocks. Pretty much. I, don't, I think it's bollocks. I just think it's somebody that's got a lot of imagination taken from films and shit like that. And he's just amalgamating them into this. Do you think that they tried to get people up there? Let's start a small... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. And I reckon those three pilots were three pilots that they tried to get up there. Yeah, totally on board with that. I wonder what happens if you type in their names in Google, whether anything comes up about them. It's a valid point. I never tried that. What's the names? As we're talking, I'll do a little bit of background research like I do every week. <laughs> no, I think that they definitely tried it. And I think if they'd have won, I think they'd have got there. Horst Sigma. Horst Sigma, Heinrich Vaughn, and Schultz Feinberg, the first men in space, potentially. Yeah, I'm up for that. can totally believe that that's something they might have been doing and they got very close to it. Well, they were doing everything succeeded. else, weren't they? Yeah. Nazis had their fingers in everything. <laughs> <laughs> had their fingers in a lot of pies, those cheeky Nazis. Mm -hmm. Who's it? The only thing I'm coming up finding on here is It's the same research. bullshit here, yeah, probably. No, <laughs> not even that. I've put in a whole Sigma mm. and literally the only thing that's come up is a Sigma, which is something in well, 40K. How? Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. Age of um, Sigma. I'll try a different name. Enric Vol. But as for pilots travelling in time and then suddenly when they reappear they start ageing really quickly, I'm not having that. No. That's bullshit. No. Sorry. <laughs> it's a nice story, but... I like it. <laughs> but I, I am genuinely down for the fact they tried that shit. Because they never really cared mm. too much about life, did they? Kill three US pilots, well, there'll be others. Even if they did find these guys in the Atlantic, in the, in in the Atlantic, they said that the, it wasn't space worthy anyway. The, the vessel that they were in. Yeah. So. That's true. But did they just hit a wormhole or something? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's possible, but really fucking slim. Was it mixed with the occult and mysticism the Nazis so loved? Did they have reptilian help? Again, it's going into realms of fantasy again, isn't it? No, oh, the reptilians could be behind it all. I think the reptilians had a pact with the Nazis. Apparently, that's a theory. The reptilians had a pact with the Nazis, gave them tech. We'll send three of your best men. Win, win the war then. Yeah. Yeah, that's always the, that's always the counter argument, isn't it? Because they could because they're on their ass at this point and they couldn't produce it quick enough. So the reptilians the are like, we'll send three of your best pilots into the future. Yeah. Oh, okay. But when they get there, they're going to age rapidly and, and die really quickly. No, they could have just like back engineered it wrong, or something went wrong, or something. I don't know. Could have happened. I'm not finding anything on any of these no, guys. No, that's because it's bollocks. It is. It really is. <laughs> I genuinely think it's just, it's just bollocks. I mean, the secret archives of the SD. Now, how do we know that the sources aren't bollocks? I mean, we've no really evidence of these of these files, have we? No, no, I guess not. It's just someone just put it in to make it look like it was Schultz from a, you know, respectable are you, source. Are you saying that www.mysterioussociety.com is telling us lies? That sums it up about right here. <laughs> well, the fact that they, I think that they were pushing towards a space programme is the main point of takeaway from here. I think that really they were going to have a good go at it, and if they'd have won, I think they'd have done it. I think they'd have got to the moon before yeah. 1969. Yep. Everyone in agreement with that, at least? Mm -hmm. Alright, so let's talk about the V2, because it is important. It is literally the daddy of all rocketry, or all modern rocketry. Mm -hmm. by, Richard, by a guy called Richard Hollingham for the BBC, because he's the. Um, the Kevin Tale is Fires to tell at the start, and so on a sunny morning, we'll quote him. 
1944. My father, then a teenager, was waiting on a train at Cromer Railway Station on the coast of eastern England. It was a beautiful clear day and from the railway platforms at Highwood the town you could see across the calm sea to the, to the German occupied Holland. On the horizon I saw three streaks go up in the air and disappear into the stratosphere, he recalls, quoting him. I am quite certain that these were V2 rockets being launched to crash somewhere where I don't know. These things will launch a mobile unit, although mobile is um, pushing it. It was a big truck with a missile on it, with <laughs> yeah. a, a little convoy of trucks carrying the T stuff and the S stuff mm -hmm. and the support stuff and the crew. It would take like a couple of hundred guys to launch these things. A mobile. So it wasn't like the V2 tanks in Crown and Conquer? It's based on that, but you're talking like a three or four hour turnaround. You've got spare missiles as well, remember, following this convoy, which had to be. and a crane to put it on the launch truck. Which then lifted it up mm. and it fired. So yes, in theory, yes, you're right. But it's they were fucking annoying. But they were because they take out all your infantry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was just like a big old big ass fucking missile. Yeah, base fighting yeah, missile. I might, I might remember. It took out your own troops, didn't it? It did. It did. It spared nobody. And sometimes it would just like fire at one guy, just shooting at it instead of like the three or four tanks. Mm -hmm. They could be taken out by a single rifleman or virtually... Yeah, because they had no Because if they game. missed the missile, then he would just sit there and shoot it, and the time it took for it to reload, it took like a couple of minutes, game time for it to reload, the infantryman would have nearly killed it. <laughs> just one guy shooting in a truck. But each V2 rocket was 14 metres, that's 46 feet high, and carried a one tonne or 900 kilograms of explosive warhead. The first attack on London on 8th of September 1944 gouged a crater 10 metres, that's 32 feet across, killed three people and injured 22. The government doesn't admit there's V2s until there's much later. Because mm. you've had the V1s and they were like a crude bomb like a missile with wings and a, and a rocket engine on the back. And we'll get to them a little bit later, but I'll explain more. But they were about 600 miles an hour, and they could be shot down by aircraft, or the Spitfire could actually go alongside it and use its wing to just tip the V2's wing, uh -huh. which would send it sparring off course. Mm -hmm. so the Mustang could do it, but let's face it, the Spitfire's a better plane. It's got a cooler <laughs> name for a start, and a nicer, it's nicer looking. However, unlike the aircraft uh, or the V2's predecessor, the V1, as I just explained, you had a bit of warning with it because you knew the engine and then it cut out. Mm -hmm. So you knew it was someone, under unless you were underneath it, you knew it wasn't near you. <laughs> You'd hear it and then it go and just drop. Right. As the V2 kind of ploughed into the earth. Uh. This was a new type of weapon. Crashing and exploding without warning in target cities such as London, Norwich, Paris, Lille and Antwerp. It did take five minutes from launch to landing. That's not bad. So if you're firing from probably deep in Germany at this point or certainly in Belgium when you're firing at London. It's the it Holland, he did. Yeah, they're firing sense, from, it? yeah, they're firing from Holland to London, yeah. Yeah. Five minutes. It's not bad, is it? No. How fast got, were they going? Got some good range. Oh, we'll get there. I think there's got some tech stuff. To quote the author's dad, Suddenly there was a large bang in a road nearby and a great cloud of debris was thrown up in the air and that was the V2 rocket. He said it was a terror weapon. You didn't hear it arriving. It was just there and bang. There were more than 1,300 V2s were fired at England and as Allied forces advanced, hundreds more were targeted at Belgium and France. Although there is no exact figure, estimates suggest that several thousand people were killed by the missiles, 2,724 in Britain alone, and but a far grimmer statistic that many more, at least 20,000, died constructing the V2s themselves. Okay, what? 20,000 died constructing it? Yeah, they were slave labourers taken from concentration camps who could weld. Weld till you're dead? Yeah, pretty much. They had specific yeah. skills to assemble this thing. And that's what I say about Von Braun. It's like, yeah, he was a genius. He was the father of the space program. I absolutely admit But he's still a member of the SS. And he still knew how his rockets were being made. 
He yes. knew this was that. He knew twenty thousand people died making these things. He had, knew they had slave laborers. Still went ahead and did it. I mean, all right, yes. If he'd have turned around and said, "No, I'm not going to," he'd have just been replaced and arrested and probably kept alive. But his family would be held hostage. You can't shoot a guy like von Braun. He's yeah. too clever. They don't, they don't tell you about that so much, though, do they? The fact that it was all done by slave labor, like. They talk about it, but yeah, you don't think about the fact that yeah, they were all created by yeah poor souls that yeah. Not much death has gone into making the bomb. Mad, that's going to cause more death, isn't it? That's it. So the prisoners, yeah, like I said, were pulled from concentration camps with their technical skills, such as welding. And when you've got like six million, well, how many hundred thousand people in a fucking concentration camp at any one time? Yeah. Thousand, someone's going to know how to do something. There's always, it's, be a, an, it's an entire society put into a camp. Yeah. Yeah, there's going to be plenty of welders in there. That's it. It'd be like it happening in Britain today, and they go, oh, we need forklift drivers. I mean, Pete have to go and work for them for 12 hours, driving a forklift for 18 hours a day with yeah. slightly better food and better conditions. It just gas me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm useless to anybody. <laughs> but until we just word to death, basically. I just run them all over my forklift accidentally. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no one would be near you and they'd have like machine guns trained on you. Yeah. They lived in appalling conditions with no daylight, little sleep, food or proper sanitation. And many were executed for attempted sabotage, and that is true. Like some of these guys knew what they were doing, building these things, and did try to sabotage them so they would fear off or go well, wrong. With weaponry, didn't they? They yeah. would sabotage their ammunition and that. Because they were stupid enough to be trusted to make it. Yep. Yeah. Eyewitness accounts describe prisoners as being hanged from cranes above the rocket assembly lines. Oh. There's your deterrent, isn't it? There's your motivation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But despite his complicity in the conditions of Mittelberg, the engineer who designed the V2, Werner von Braun, came to be feted as a hero of the space age. The Allies realised that the V2 was a machine unlike anything they'd developed themselves. At the heart of the V2 was a powerful motor capable of taking the rocket more than 80 kilometres, that's 50 miles, above the Earth, in a trajectory of some 190 kilometres, or 120 miles, fuelled by liquid ethanol and oxygen. It was much more sophisticated than anything built before and effectively the world's first space rocket. Okay, so it's not quite from Hungary to uh, London in five minutes then. Oh, you're not doing Hungary from, to London, no. You're doing like Belgium to London, Holland to London though. Mm. So we're hitting London from there. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, you'd just get it, wouldn't you? One of the most important new technologies developed for the V2 was an automatic guarding system which operated independently of controllers on the ground with a destination programmed into the onboard analogue computer. Once a rocket was in flight, its gyroscopes would continuously track the craft's position in three dimensions and any deviations in course and rudders fitted to the fins on the side of the rocket would automatically adjust the heading and trajectory to keep it on target. So this is some really advanced tech for the time. Mm. No one else has got this. And now we've got gyroscopes in our phones. Mm. Yeah. Like now, not surprisingly, when the war ended, the Americans, Soviets and British scrambled to get their hands on V2 technology. And with no desire to work for Stalin, von Braun made a shrewd decision to surrender the Americans while the Russians got their hands on the V2 factory and test range. So this is what the Russians actually got ahead. Is they got a lot of the stuff, or the majority yeah. of the stuff, the Americans and the Brits, we got some stuff, but we got a lot more scientists. A lot of the scientists didn't want to work for the Russians because they're Nazis, they're communists. They weren't far different, were they, really? Mm. I guess. Well, they saw the Slavic people as less than them, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And, so, well, we'd rather, and they knew they'd be treated better by the Americans, uh, you know, and the Brits. Because mm. we're a Western democracy and we don't believe in slave labour ourselves. And about the Americans in that. Yeah. At the time, they still believed in the slave labour, didn't they? Let's well, technically, it still goes on in prisons, but that's another story for the day. Well, so both the Americans and the Soviets took the V2s to bits to decipher their workings, as Millard, who wrote a book about it. The Soviets completely recreated a V2, and the Americans took them over to America to launch and carry out some of the first upper atmosphere experiments. 
However, the US knew it wasn't the hardware that was important, it was the men behind it, and they had Von Braun, who was the daddy of this. Yeah. He's the guy that's he's Germany's top guy. I cannot overestimate how much he is the top guy at this field. Although the military's priority was to develop intercontinental ballistic missiles, obviously, because then you can drop an A bomb on someone. I'm going to use a bomber to do it then, aren't you? No. Yeah. Can't stop these at this point. Too fast. The German engineer now had the opportunity to pursue his dreams of space flight, and that is true. He'd all his ambition and all of this, deep down, was he wanted to get people into space. He wanted mm -hmm. to get the men to the moon. He always, I think he wrote that as a kid. That was his ambition. Obviously, he used this to get there, which is the problem, isn't it? So the moon, the whole human space travel is already mired in blood before we even start properly. Not by slave yeah. labourers, yeah. yeah. And one of the most brutal regimes that ever ruled the planet. Yeah. Or ever ruled on the planet. You know, we got to the moon using the V2 tech and it was developed with massive resources and some very, very grim ones. So that's sadly the legacy of the space race is put down on it. But yeah, it all comes from, from the V2. Mm. This is world end of World War Two, which is which is crazy. Yeah. Do you think how far we've come in such a short time? Probably because Eisenhower got tech off the aliens. <laughs> Let's look at some stuff they actually did or attempt. Because Wunderwaffe, they, they had some, because they, they were so advanced, that's the thing. They, they had all these advances, but... They frittled away their resources instead of just using shit that worked. They tried to make this and using the next step. They went straight to space age. Mm. Alright, so let's have a look at some of the stuff they tried to develop. Trainflugjäger, or thrust wing hunter. There's a picture of it. Now, for the listeners, it looked like a, basically a V2 rocket with helicopter blades on it yeah. around the middle. But each of these blades holds has got a jet engine. Fucking hell, that's mental. So it's <laughs> vertical takeoff. They'd be upright on their tail. Right, yeah, the okay. rocket boost off the bottom, the engine, the main engine, and then these three things would spin around, firing up into the air. And it worked. It got up into the air. Never. It worked like a helicopter. But the problem was, can't fucking land them. Because <laughs> you got to look over your shoulder. Can't land them. There's no way they could land it. But they, they tried it. They figured out they couldn't work. But this is it was on the. They had prototypes. Wow. Messerschmitt. This one got into production. They made 400 of these. The Messerschmitt Me 163 Comet. It was a rocket-powered fighter that could reach speeds of over 1,000 kilometers an hour. Wow. 300 were built for development. I've heard four in the European combat theater. Rapid fuel consumption and limited area of operation made the Comet only capable of localised point defence missions. So you have a... Do you know basically, what that looks like? What? That looks like Cosford. Possibly is. I think that is. I do think that is actually Cosford because they do have a few of the Nazi planes there, don't they? I think they do have a Comet. I've been there. I think, I think they've recently. got one of them. At, which, just up the road from us. <laughs> now there is see one of these. This thing is a basically the entire rocket with a pilot and some guns on it. And they fire this up. You see the trolley and the wheels underneath mm -hmm. on the picture. You can go and check this out. List of the ME six one three Comet. They would fall away at the takeoff. They would attach the plane. Huh. Okay. The sled was. was the wheels land. weren't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they weren't meant to land. Really. So you'd fire up at a thousand kilometers an hour. You would get some shots off. You got about eight minutes of fuel. Then your thrust dies. You steer for home. And it's got big wings. It's delta winged, and it glides its way back under no power. Mm. And you've got a sled to land on. Fuck. Hell. Right? And you've still got some possible fuel dotted around in the engine which may combust at any time and melt your face. <laughs> you have balls of steel to get one of them. You have. The major problem is because you're gliding back with no power, you're then See, really you're easy meat for high fighters who've you, you you've let you have your eight minutes of glory and now we're going to shoot you down. Yeah. They got like eight confirmed kills or something like that. Is that it? That's it. Uh, the three to four hundred were built. Now this one's from the Schwerer Gustav. It's a railway gun. It's a gun so big you stick it on a railway. It's basically a naval gun. Wow. And some. Yeah, it's got a 32.5 metre barrel and can fire shells at almost 47 kilometres away. Oh, oh. 
thing is you've got no traverse, so what you'd have to do is you'd have to have people to come along and put in, you know, the railway turntables? Or they'd have to use one That's of those. The so that when you go onto different tracks, the train or lo the locomotive will come along the track mm -hmm. and then it'll be spun around to face a different bit of track. Okay. And then it'll reverse or go forwards to line up to the carriages. Okay. To get onto different tracks. It turns the entire yeah, yeah. thing and it locks together. You seen Thomas the Tank? Well, funny, I was about to say <laughs> I didn't pay attention to the tracks. <laughs> yeah. So they would build one of them around it, mm. or they'd use an existing one so he could pivot to turn. Mm. But yeah. What would the targeting be like on that for 47 kilometres? Um, you'd hope. Yeah, I thought so. They're using them at the siege of Sevastopol on the Eastern Front. They used it to shell Paris back in World War One. They said they'd, the Germans got a hard on for railway guns, basically. They had them in World War One too. And they built the Nazis, obviously, had to fucking go a bit bigger. Mm. But you're looking at a shell roughly about the size of a telephone box ish. Oh. But you ain't think of the logistics train this had behind it and it can fire one round an hour. <laughs> so what you'd have to do is what they would do is they would usually like to operate it out of a tunnel. Mm. So you'd pull forwards, raise the gun, get it loaded and everything, fire your shot and then get as quickly as possible, because you've got marauding Allied fighters around. Lower the gun, get it back in, into the tunnel, reload it. Uh -huh. Come out again in a bit. One an hour though, it's useless, isn't it? Yeah. Unless you had like a hundred of them. Yeah, but you can't, this is a logistics train. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, it's taking like a couple of hundred, maybe three to four hundred guys to fire this thing for one shot an hour. It's not worth it, is it? No. Nah. Well, That's why they didn't catch on. Yeah. Yeah. This one's an interesting one. You may recognise it mm, from the picture. It's like the stealth bomber. Yes, it looks exactly like the B-2 Spirit American current stealth bomber. The Horton XV... Sorry, HX-15. So HX-8. Get my Roman numerals mixed up. Wouldn't it be an 8? Yeah, No, it is, it is the HX. I've heard it. It's, it's a HX-8. Okay. Okay. It was a concept intercontinental bomber designed by the brothers Walter and Reimar Horton, who were Luftwaffe officers. The aircraft was supposed as part of an initiative of the German Ministry of Aviation, the Reichsluftfahrtministerium, <laughs> called America Bomber, to obtain a long-range strategic bomber for the Luftwaffe that would be capable of striking the United States from Germany. These things are made of wood as well, so you had limited radar Huh. Bounce back. If they'd have had these in the Battle of Britain, mm -hmm. they'd have won. They could have taken out our radar stations, we would have seen coming. So they really are the absolute inspiration to for the stealth. stealth bomber. And they did build a prototype and it sat in the Smithsonian for a long time in a back room with its wings off. Huh. Wow. This one's also good. The mouse, the Panzerkampfwagen 8. I did Panzerkampfwagen. Yeah, they called it the mouse because it's the biggest tank ever made. The camp wagon. <laughs> I love the German language. <laughs> the Panzerkampfwagen 8 mouse, named ironically, was a super heavy breakthrough tank designed to punch holes in enemy lines with a 128mm Pac-44 anti-tank field artillery gun. Is that big? <laughs> yes, that's very big. Because in the biggest gun they mounted in the, the normal tank, the Tiger was an 88mm. So, 120... Like a tank. Yes. Going back to Command and Conquer. Except the Mammoth tank has two of those. Yeah. <laughs> those little missiles it fires off anti... It does, anti infantry missiles, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was designed by Austrian-German engineer Ferdinand Porsche. Mm. And two tr prototypes were developed between 1933 and 1944. They were deployed, but most of them broke down. Their engines were terrible and most were destroyed by their crew. There is one example left, as you can see. Most of them were destroyed by their crew? Yeah, because they'd broken down. They couldn't let it fall into Russian hands, so they'd, every tank comes with a demolition charge. <laughs> There's a timer, and you set mm. it. Because you can't let it fall into enemy hands, because they might turn it back against you. Yeah. Yeah. Every tank has a demolition charge to blow up from the inside. Wow. Didn't know that. No, I didn't know that either. Yeah. The Arado A234 Blitz, the first jet-powered bomber introduced into combat theater in 1944. It could reach a speed of 780 kilometers an hour and operate well above Allied fighters' range at an altitude of 11,000 meters. So 
it's going a lot faster and it can't the Allied uh, fighters can't get as high. And that's about the same height as a jumbo jet nowadays, about thirty seven thousand feet. Yeah. Obviously yeah. limited numbers, the fact we were bombing them round the clock, they couldn't get this stuff into production. I was going to say, because it sounds pretty good, that one. Yeah. Of all the ones we've had, that one sounds like the most effective. And so, of course, you remember the Allies introduced Gladiator and the Meteor. Sorry, the Meteor first. Was it? Shit. It was a Gladiator, it was a Gloucester Gladiator, sorry. And we introduced that as the first jet fighter. We got that up in 1945. So let's say the war lasted another year. Those things might have been able to get caught. But maybe not. You got an advance on it. One of the FX 1400 world's first cruise missile. Radio guided, precision guided, anti ship glide bomb. And designed to take out cruisers and battleships. They did strikes successfully on British naval and merchant vessels. I like the look of that one. Yeah, it looks neat, doesn't it? Mm. First cruise missile. The Heinschel HS-298, a rocket-powered mid-wing monoplane air-to-air -air missile system. So you're using missiles now, guided air-to-air -air missiles. Like Pinocchio, that one of those, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it looks like one of them, is it a swordfish? A fish, yeah. Yeah. Is it a Not a swordfish, they got like a... Narwhal. Fisher. Mm. Yeah, like a narwhal. Mm. The big horn on its head. Yeah, I was thinking of something else, but yeah. Or a kingfisher yeah, as well. Right. We'll talk about the ME262 first jet fighter. Downed 542 Allied aircraft after being deployed in 1944. That's not bad for a year's no. worth operating with limited parts. I mean, remember primitive jet engines have to be taken apart. I feel like every mission rebuilt virtually. Why? Because it was just the strains and stresses, the metals, uh, the alloys inside. Uh, it's a lot of heat. Mm -hmm. Looks like a paper airplane, that one. They didn't have the technology to make better parts to last longer, basically. Yeah. So you had to re replace most of the engine after like a good few hours flight. Good hell. Yeah. That's the same with all jet engines. Jet engines are terribly destructive. They require a lot of maintenance. Fuck me. Even commercial flights. The alloys are better nowadays, but they still <laughs> require a lot of maintenance, <laughs> genuinely. I'd imagine they're thoroughly looked over after every long haul flight. It does make you wonder how many more planes just don't fight the sky. It's amazing, isn't it? Mm. It's one of the safest forms of travel. M maintenance. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's what it boils down to. We've got commercial flight pretty sussed. We know what a plane has to be like to, for it to arrive safely. Yeah, all right, things do go wrong now and again, but that's usually human or very rarely mechanical errors mm. on planes, though, isn't it? Mm. Might lose an engine, I mean, all right, that's... But that's gremlins. That's, that's, <laughs> that's gremlins, exactly. Got no phalanges. There's something on the wing. <laughs> the phalanges are missing. Yeah, there's a flange missing. Now, the Arado uh, E555 was a contender for the Ministry of Asia's America Bomber Initiative. It would have featured six jets, flying angular wing design, and remotely operated defensive turrets. So that's going to fire its way to America, drop a bomb and get back. Looks well sinister. It does, does, doesn't it? Carl Garant, also called the Moser Carl, was a large separate siege mortar. The mortar was capable of firing shells over 2,170 kilograms at targets 10 kilometres away. A big tank. Two it is. Big tons. Wow. That's quite a fucking. It's quite a shell. A shell is two and a half ton. Yeah. I don't I know. We'll do the barrel was a bit small. Mortar, I mean, it's different. Um, you know, they did the mouse. Mm. They also had this idea. They were going to call the Ratter. It was going to be a land kreutzer. It was going to be like a land battleship. Cool. 1,000 tons. Could carry a dual 28 centimeter SKC slash 34 naval gun turret and several anti aircraft guns. It was suggested by German arms manufacturer Friedrich Krupp, but it was cancelled in early 1943 by Speer, who saw it as a complete waste of resources. <laughs> it is very but sort of. It was, it was put on the drawing board. Ostentatious, board. isn't it? It was like, let's have a thousand ton tank. Naval guns, fuck it. 
They're just trying to outdo each other and that, isn't it? Yeah. It is a big boys game. All you've got to do is... Money flying around. I'm disappointed I didn't see no, like, lightning guns, though. Yeah, sorry, they never... I mean, one thing we have missed off the start on the list, of course, the assault rifle, the STG-44. They made it in secret. Hitler didn't like it at first, and they made it in secret because they knew it was ace. Mm. And when he went to his Russian generals and said, "Well, oh, his Rus his generals fighting on the Russian front even," and said, "What do you want?" And one of them says, "Oh, well, I want more of these new rifles. They're fucking awesome." And he's like, "What new rifles?" And they show it him, and he's like, oh, "Actually, this is quite good, isn't it? All right, put it into production. And I'm going to call it the Sturmgewehr or the assault rifle because it was fully automatic." Uh -huh. That's where Klashnikov ripped his off his idea from the uh -huh. German. So yeah, there you go. Is that the first? Even the rifle, was it? Yeah, the first one, and it's got. It looks exactly like an AK-47, virtually, mm. except very similar, aren't they? The ultimate symbol of communism is actually a Nazi ripoff. <laughs> <laughs> And the V3 cannon to end the Vengeance or Retribution Weapon 3 was a large caliber gun that fired propellant charges to increase the velocity of a project over hundreds of miles. Now this thing wasn't one barrel, it was one big barrel with little V-shaped points pointing upwards, like chevrons pointing upwards along the length. Those had rockets. This was powered by rockets, the shell. They would fire down, propelling the shell up, and as the shell passed each one, that in turn would fire. Mm. These are this is built into a, a hill. There's going to be a complex of them. Uh, obviously, the British intelligence got word of it and was like, "Nah, you don't have any of that." Hmm. It was designed to shell London from the French coast, so we bombed the shit out of it. <laughs> it was built into a mountain, literally, and then even when we made sure we occupied it and double destroyed it to make sure the French had no bargaining power over uh, us at all. Yeah. But yeah, it was. Just, it, they did actually use them. They built smaller ones into uh, when they were retreating and fired into Belgium and Holland. Indiscriminate shelling from fairly large calibers, uh, battleship level, cruiser level, definitely. So you're talking sort of eight to nine inch caliber. The London one was like a battleship level. You went fourteen inch. Vengeance and Retribution cannon. If they just spent less time trying to develop mad shit like this and actually put their effort into producing their stuff that was really good and that worked and was superior to anything the Allies could put in the field in most areas, apart from probably in the air, well, depends how quickly the American aircraft and British jet aircraft came on, but you're putting bouncies into the field, 100 tons, and Allied tanks taking that out. No. no. The jet aircraft, which is light years, well, at least a good five years ahead of us. Mm. The weapon, the mental, they just, but they just put stuff into the stuff that worked. Is that that thing with the three rotor wings on <laughs> the jet engines? It wasn't would look it, mental. Wasn't it the Vulcan at 1954? Was that like first jet? That was, no, that was part of V Force. We had the Victor and Valiant before Vulcan. We were one of the first ones to get the jet fighters into the air. Mm. Uh, the Americans came in shortly the after. First jet bombers, then, was it the was, Vulcan? Well, I'm, no, or we. Four we, jet. We pro I think we had a few. Oh, God, I can't remember what they were called. I remember it was the first of something. <laughs> no, because it was like we went from the heavy bomber with the Avro Manchester after the Lancaster. This is really nerdy history stuff now, sorry, listener. Forget we're recording, we're having a general conversation. You know, the Avro Manchester was Britain's last four winged heavy bomber with propellers, four propeller winged heavy bomber. And then we went to, I think it was the Victor, and then the, oh, the Valiant, then the Victor, one of the two. Vulcan was the third one, the last one out of the lot. So we had the Victor and the Valiant before. It was V Force. We used to call our nuclear, that's what we used to call our nuclear deterrent force, V Force. Yeah. So the Nazis, they were, <laughs> the, Nazis. the Nazis, was like an aid to their sort of own downfall by wanting to do too much, you know, sort of such ideas of grandeur, you watch yeah. Nazi mega structures. I love Nazi you know, mega structures. You know, and they've got this going on, you know, I think... Uh, they bit off more than they could chew, basically. Yeah, basically. Fucked themselves over in the same breath, basically. Well, that's yeah. you're spending two billion Reichsmarks on V2s, which are... At this stage of the war, really hard to make. They consume a lot of other resources. 
Killed lots of slaves. Killed lot. Well, the slaves don't matter to them. That's as well. I suppose they had many more, didn't they? That's it. There's a never-ending supply of them. It doesn't matter. You could be making tiger tanks, which well, was they clearly worth. You both could be smart, making measurements. <laughs> it was just this superiority thing, wasn't it? This ego thing. Mm. But that also drove them on to make better stuff than we were producing. That's why we won. We made more stuff that was good, the rather work. than fewer stuff <laughs> that was really good. Yeah. And kind of overwhelm them. But yeah, the, the war had lasted another year and we weren't hitting them as hard. I think I think they might have got some of that shit into the air. I think it was um, military decisions to, oh, break, the Russian to, break, thing the, was, to break the Soviet Nazi pact. The Von Ribbentrop pact. I mean, that was his downfall, wasn't it? Mm. He got bogged down in Russia and the Russian went into it. No one can conquer Russia, it's too big. Yeah. Well, he was long. 30 miles from Moscow, wasn't he? He was, he but then the Russian... to go to oil fields. Yeah, but also the Russian winter kicked in yeah. at that point, and... Yeah. And also the Americans joined the war. That's also another factor. As much as we hate to admit it, they did fail us out a bit. They did, but also they couldn't have won it without us. No. They could have joined a bit earlier and saved a few lives, but hey-ho. Well... <laughs> Always late to the party, the Yanks, aren't they? <laughs> Clean it up, just take all the credit. And they take all the credit, credit yeah. <laughs> we put all the dog work in and they come in. And it's just a up. great British victory from coming behind and to win in extra time. You know? <laughs> yeah, but like I said, it was mainly the Russians and the Americans. That's the Russians would have won it without the Western Allies anyway. They'd have got there, it doesn't matter. If we'd have just sat in Britain looking threatening and launching raids, we'd have had to keep large forces based around there. And even though we promised to invade and we'd, so therefore we had to, if we'd have just raided and sniped at them for the war would have lasted longer, but the Russians would have done that eventually. Is my opinion. Might have took another year, another two, but the Russians would have got there eventually. If we and then maybe we sauntered in at the end, which is Surprised the West didn't do actually. Just saw to do it at the end after the Germans were completely fucked. Well, that was it. One of the Russians wanted us in earlier. You did? They wanted it in 43? Yeah. And we kept delaying it and delaying it. And they took millions and millions of casualties. Yeah, because we knew that our. Well, conscript us, did it? So we, we weren't really care. Didn't really care about the Russians because they were gone communism anyway. Let them fight out the Nazis well, for a bit. See who's see left. Yeah, and then we'll pick up the pieces. That's what it was, really, wasn't it? Yeah. It was an alliance of convenience. We did give the Russians a lot of free shit, too. Well, yeah, we helped, didn't we? Yeah, yeah we... we wanted them to win, didn't it? Well, of course, yeah. yeah it, it, was, it was an alliance of but convenience. But we didn't want them to win easily, I guess. 50 years later, mate, we gave them McDonald's. Come on. <laughs> One more gone now. Pepsi. It's gone oh, now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oops. They're all yeah. local bankers. <laughs> Have a big Joe Stalin meal <laughs> <laughs> with a, a, and big Putin. <laughs> Rasputin burger for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that's the end. So I think yeah. we can all agree that uh, history, yeah, mad history, time travel, Nazis. <laughs> it's all there. It's all wrapped up into one neat little package. Yeah, yeah. I've seen it all before. <laughs> anyway, let's say thank you for listening. I've been Ben. Don't do the favourite. Don't join a cult. And you can follow us on Facebook at Cutting Through the Bull in the Post to the Apocalypse. SoundCloud is Cutting Through the Bull in the PTA. YouTube is Apocalypse Bull. Hit the subscribe button. It means nothing to you. It's one little click. Come in a lot to us. We can improve the quality of the sound and stuff like that. Get some more microphones. Invest yeah. a bit more in the production. It's a one click. Tell your friends as well. Have a listen. All right, that's me. Okay, I've been Mike. Thanks for listening. Peace out. May the force be with you. And I've been Claire. Keep an open mind, but not so open that it ripples out your ears. And I've been Pete. Game over, man. It's game over. Yeah.